We're here today to defend the most basic of all human rights. The right to health and the right to life. They rush through the office and treat us like common criminals. Hey, get your hands up. Get them up right now. Free! Hey, guys, guys, it's only vitamins. Vitamine! 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 Tens of millions of men were cheated out of an effective, non-toxic therapy. Just cheated out of it and forced to buy an expensive, dangerous therapy that is only half as good. And that upsets me. I'm angry about that. If there's a higher corporate good to be served by breaking the law, by having the FDA work with the Codex and try and drag the U.S. into this nightmare, then they're all for it. Codex is bad. It's bad for a lot of people. And it's bad for the very people who need it the most. And it's the power that's in the WTO that we have to deal with ultimately. And I don't like the trend. Kurt, turn the camera off. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. Fear. Its darkness causes humanity to make awful choices. With dreadful power, fear can rule our lives and paralyze lofty hopes and dreams in an instant. It is the antithesis of God, the destructive dark side. It is the ghost that haunts the mind, a universal trait, a global affliction, and deployed all too often by those intent on inflicting control over the masses. Fear preys on the most vulnerable among us. Fear sells. And nowhere is fear peddled more shamelessly than in the fields of medicine and human nutrition. Fear anesthetizes us. It coerces us, making us believe that we can do little on our own to prevent or treat disease and forces whole nations to kneel at the altars of the drug industry. And of course, the fear mongers are also preying on fear of disease. And the solution that the fear mongers give us are drugs. Yet drugs are the single most dangerous thing we can put in our mouths. It's a sad fact that pharmaceuticals have become the dope of modern man. And make no mistake, we are addicted. Last year, between three and five billion prescriptions were written in the US alone. And for all of its many miracles and heroism, the pharmaceutical fantasy has also left disaster in its wake. The tragedies of drug side effects are being exposed daily. Prozac. Biox, Celebrex, Baycol, Larium, and Zoloft, just to name a few, are deeply uncomfortable reminders that secrecy and sales have often circumvented safety. There is also the crippling burden of health insurance and the millions who are debilitated by a wave of red ink bankrupted as a result of an unexpected illness that they could not afford. As if by design, health choices are limited Information is scarce, lives are ruined, and the truth be damned. Business is business, and people don't like competition. And those things, um, smart business people uh, may not always do something that's best for, for the people or for someone's health. In addition to these painful realities of life, however, an abundance of evidence now suggests that this holy reverence towards modern medicine may be killing us. I wrote uh, Death by Modern Medicine, inspired actually after writing a paper called Death by Medicine. And what I found after analyzing government databases and peer-reviewed journal articles, I found that 784,000 people are dying annually, prematurely, due to modern medicine intervention. And also found studies that said we're only capturing 5 to 20 percent of the actual deaths. We're clear that the status quo is equal to a premature death in this country. Someone needs to stand up and scream and say, foul, something's gone awry. Somebody needs to stop this madness and say to the public, there's a better option. We will no longer accept the status quo. But the fear machine is well oiled by petrochemical dollars and a near worldwide monopoly in healthcare. 
It works overtime to prevent the truth about dietary supplements from getting out to the public. Governments, particularly in Europe and the United States, seem all too eager to comply with the robber barons of health care. It has always been so, as evidenced by this 40-year-old government film, which is but one of many in their arsenals. But it's still the same old snake oil. During the 1990s, however, despite generations of institutional bias, American consumers won critical battles against the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and the medical pharmaceutical establishment. In the mid-90s, there were movements to put all supplements on a prescription basis. And in all the countries in the world where they've done that, it more than doubled the cost and made them not available. And it's, part, it's really a freedom of choice issue. It's not a company manufacturer issue. It's a consumer's issue. So we were fighting for the right to have access for our own use, our own families, and our own businesses. And fortunately, the health food consumer felt the same way. We actually were able to marshal one day in a period of hours, one million phone calls to the government. It was really a citizen's uprising. This massive consumer movement for healthcare freedom was invigorated when the FDA became enveloped in controversy of its own making. The agency approved a guns drawn raid at the clinic of Dr. Jonathan Wright and also raided dozens of health food stores in a premeditated power grab. Consumer outrage fueled Hollywood to become immersed in the debate and actors like James Earl Jones and Sharon Stone became part of a national campaign for healthcare freedom of choice. When Mel Gibson came aboard, he documented his views in memorable fashion. Free! Hey, guys, got it. It's only vitamins. Vitamin C, you know, like in oranges. The result of the consumer outcry was that Deshay, the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act, passed overwhelmingly in 1994. This became the only national law that linked the use of nutrients in dietary supplements to reduced risk of disease. And since Deshay helped ensure relatively free access to a wide range of dietary supplements for consumers, activists pulled back from the front lines, thinking that their struggles were over. Others, like Joe Bassett, knew better. We're in a particular industry, for the sake of a better term, the health food industry, that's always been under attack. It's never stopped. It still isn't stopping because you have vested interests. In our country, you have everybody using vested interests, and the ones that are really uh, entrenched use the government. I believe Deshay has always been under attack, except for the first few years after Deshay was passed. The present attacks are very broad, which means worldwide, and some of the attacks are just specific to the United States. Now, a bureaucratic shadow called Codex Alimentarius threatens to silence the opposition forever, both here and abroad. But Codex began innocuously enough in 1963 as a creation of two arteries of the United Nations, the Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Health Organization. Back then, Nearly everyone endorsed their two major goals, to provide nutritious foods for developing nations and to shape guidelines for dangerous industrial chemicals in the food supply. Within the past decade, however, Codex Alimentarius has altered its mission dramatically, many say negatively so, to include a wide swathe of products, including dietary supplements and genetically modified organisms. Mr. Scott Tipps began serving as a U.S. delegate to Codex in June of 2000. During the first meetings, he did everything he could to communicate with the head of the U.S. delegation. I, in a flurry of notes, passed comments and suggestions and the like to Elizabeth Yetley, who was the American delegate there, and it made no impact. In fact, the only impact I had was to call her, her during a break and uh, basically be very tough with her about a particular clause that she was trying to remove from the final report. That particular sentence or clause basically said that the United States supports the right of consumers to have free access to vitamins and minerals, and she had unilaterally yanked that from the final reports. This attitude by Ms. Yetley, who is an employee of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, is reflective of Codex meetings in general. 
In an attempt to shine light on those who are unilaterally making public policy in private, health freedom advocate John Hamill took a small video camera into two codex meetings in 1998. These grainy videos are all that remain of the tapes, which mysteriously disappeared. Moving right along, agenda number five on uh, violence and minerals. Are you going to strike that second paragraph? Well, these are draft positions. They go in a draft position. So they're not, a, not the final nor the formal position. You've seen the letter from Ron Paul, then. And this was signed by Ron Paul, uh, Congressman Stump, and Congressman Cook. We have received a lot of mail. We've looked at all of it. And you acknowledge that this represents the will of the American people and the will of Congress, correct? There's a wide range of opinions on this one. Despite multiple written requests and the intervention of a U.S. congressman, the FDA refused to answer any questions about codex, dietary supplements, or even labeling for this documentary. But judging from his rare interview with Michael R. Taylor, then Deputy Commissioner for Policy at the FDA, it is apparent that the agency is unaccustomed to meaningful questions about health policy by the media. It, you stated your concern, and the FDA certainly has, on, on mm -hmm. L-tryptophan. Uh, what about your concern regarding something like Prozac, that very well documented 28,000 mm -hmm. adverse reports, uh, uh, 1,600 suicides mm -hmm. associated with that drug? <coughs> Um, we had drugs that go through our uh, very rigorous uh, testing and, and review process are very well understood chemicals and drugs are recognized to have both risks and benefits. Uh, that's why they go through a rigorous evaluation and when those products are put out on the market we have a good scientific understanding of both the risks and benefits and that's laid out in very detailed labeling that physicians then use to decide whether to prescribe those products for their patients. Side effects are part of pharmaceuticals. That's recognized, and that's why we're so careful scientifically. There's just no comparison between that situation and what we are dealing with with dietary supplements, which have not been subjected to that kind of study, have not been evaluated by FDA. And a large part of the problem with these supplements is that we simply don't know uh, about their safety. We don't know about their benefits, uh, yet they're being out there marketed uh, for, in some cases, for serious disease-related purposes. It's a big difference. Well, obviously, they, they would say something <coughs> along the lines of that it was the only natural alternative to some of these kinds of, of drugs, mm -hmm. and, and that's a concern to people that want natural alternatives, right. I suppose. Right. Um, and since the, case, the cases against Prozac have been so high, mm -hmm. um, people would question whether or not the health uh, risks of L-tryptophan again, versus a, a Prozac and right. that kind of usage is uh, judged under the same standards, if you will. Well, okay, it really yeah. wasn't on the list of things we were going to get into today. Well, he mentioned L-tryptophan, and it just... Uh, As the producers tried to get an answer from the Deputy well, Commissioner of the FDA, so it really, Mr. I, Taylor seemed to lose his patience with the tone of the interview. Mentioned, so I, I thought that I would follow up on it. That's Kurt, all. turn the camera off. We can talk. You know, I'm happy to talk about this. I don't want to spend the whole morning on it. But of course, Mr. Taylor was anything but happy to discuss the safety record of Prozac versus the amino acid L-tryptophan, which the FDA banned outright when Prozac was approved by the agency. And it is important to note that the Food and Drug Administration has assigned Mr. Taylor's wife, Christine Lewis Taylor, to the World Health Organization, where she is now chairwoman of the Nutrient Risk Assessment Project. I don't think that you can say that anybody at FDA has ever been a friend of dietary supplements. Anybody. They are friends of the, the classical reductionist scientific system that is based on cause and effect and uh, doing a bunch of huge and costly studies which are the backbone of the pharmaceutical industry, which are the, which are the driving uh, force of our healthcare system, which is driving us into bankruptcy and killing between 207,000 700,000 people a year. Some of them honestly believe in the useless medication. More, however, are bunkum artists, without pity or conscience, willing to risk the lives of fellow human beings to line their own pockets. Institutional hypocrisy and bias are endemic at the agency. In fact, the FDA has made no secret of its intentions to harmonize the U.S. vitamin and mineral standards with Codex, thereby reducing the dosages of common vitamins and minerals to ridiculously low levels. They've said so before Congress, in the National Register, and even on their own website. 
that system is not a good system and the dietary supplement guideline, the vitamin mineral guideline, mimics the ideas of that system and tries to push them onto the international stage for vi vitamins and minerals. Bad thinking all the way around. We are at a stage in society when a large number of people, consumers and patients, are waking up to the fact that the healthcare system that they've placed their trust in now for decades is not delivering the healthcare that they need. They're beginning to appreciate that very often if they have major diseases like cancer or heart disease, that the so-called solution to these diseases is in fact killing them. Today, all new drugs must be proved safe and effective before they can be marketed. In other words, the medicine must be safe and must do what's claimed for it. This is why we see this incredible growth in consumer demand for natural products. And of course, just as the consumer is starting to make decisions about what they want to do in healthcare, the regulators have decided, with a lot of pressure from big industry sectors, to say, you can't have it. It's reserved for us. When the WTO, the World Trade Organization, became a reality in the 1990s, the power of Codex was heightened immeasurably. This new worldwide body, devoted solely to the harmonization of trade standards, gave Codex the enforcement capability that had eluded it for decades. Two US congressmen, a Democrat and a Republican, have a philosophical divide on free trade, but agree completely on the dangers of the WTO and Codex. Now, the WTO is said to be set up for free trade, and I happen to like free trade. I like low tariffs, and I like goods and services flowing across borders. Uh, I studied economics in college. I'm a skeptic of the whole theory of free trade, and it really crystallized around uh, the NAFTA and the WTO agreements. I am a champion of national sovereignty, so I do not like the idea of getting involved in what the founders called entangling alliances. Uh, I remember talking uh, to uh, Mickey Cantor, the president's uh, special trade representative, and I'd studied a little bit, and I said, I can't understand how we're going to bind ourselves to this agreement, which has a secret dispute resolution process, uh, which has no r rules regarding conflict of interest, and they will essentially preempt U.S. law. And then when you go to the next step of becoming a member of the World Trade Organization, means to me that we as a people and as a Congress, uh, we give up too much of our responsibility and our prerogatives. I said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. They can't preempt our laws. I said, oh, you're right. They can just fine us for having our laws, and we can pay perpetual fines because we have laws that protect consumers of the environment, or we can repeal our laws. But now we're talking about turning it over to a world organization that's going to force harmonization. So it's, it's working as designed, as far as you're concerned, which is to protect corporate interests and uh, overrule governments and stick it to consumers. And they'll do that under the name of free trade and globalization and pretend that they're on the, on, on the side of, of, of freedom. But actually, they're, they're not. They're, they're on the side of regulations and special interests and protection of uh, certain big corporations. If there's a higher corporate good to be served by breaking the law, by having the FDA uh, you know, uh, work uh, with uh, the Codex and uh, try and drag the U.S. into this uh, nightmare, then uh, they're all for it and they're doing it. So we do what the WTO tells us, and that's why I'm very leery of the WTO and I'd just soon we get out of the WTO. This would be like the ultimate reaching of government uh, into our personal health lives, uh, which would be unbelievable. And, and not even our government, some, you know, bureaucratic, diffuse, uh, multinational, secretive government. It's the power that's in the WTO that we have to deal with ultimately. And I don't like the trend. On Capitol Hill, legislators are now debating the merits of yet another trade agreement called CAFTA the Central American Free Trade Agreement. This latest Trojan horse was wheeled into Washington as a savior for a faltering economy. But as consumers in Europe could confirm, it will only lead to more backroom deals, deals that could spell the end of health freedom as we know it. Now people think that that could never happen here. Uh, probably at one time people in England thought it would never happen there, and yet the, their government has ignored over a million signatures on petitions 
on this issue, saying, sorry guys, we are now a member of the European Union, and we must harmonize to European law. If we aren't careful in our hemisphere, the same thing will happen as a result of the free trade area of the Americas. But the trend towards the WTO, NAFTA, and now CAFTA, being used to harmonize laws and regulations to favor pharmaceutical interests, has long been a reality in the European Union. German representatives at Codex began to push the idea of creating safe upper limits on vitamins and minerals. And this was favored in the UK until Dr. Robert Verkirk began orchestrating a precise legal, scientific and public relations strategy to stop it. His organization, the Alliance for Natural Health, brought a landmark legal challenge to the EU Food Supplements Directive. In April 2005, the Advocate General in the European Court declared that the EU Directive should be declared invalid under EU law. In July of 2005, UK and European consumers will discover the fate of this legal battle, and it is anything but a sure win. What's coming down the line from Codex and from Europe is very disturbing. First, you got 450 million people over there. Secondly, they have the most restrictive nutrient access of any of the free world. Third, you just had a woman in France arrested and is now undergoing trial for selling 500 milligrams of vitamin C tablets. Between the draconian regulations of the EU Supplement Directive and the ominous Codex guidelines, which will be voted on in July 2005, there is little doubt that health freedom lies in the balance in Europe, in America and throughout the world. The World Health Freedom Foundation is supporting this movement in, in Europe because there's no question if we stop it in Europe, its effect on the United States will be less. And anyone who thinks that Kodak or the European Union or the World Trade Organization when it comes to very restrictive policies in Europe is not going to have an effect on the United States is crazy. You've got 450 million people over there. They have enormous trade with us. They deal in steel and textiles, etc. And if they are upset with our libertarian policies regarding nutrient supplements, it's going to affect other economic systems. Now, we might have sovereign uh, protection, but good gosh, that will fly away at an instant with the stroke of a pen if a trade agreement is challenged. What's happening in, in Europe, just like the trade winds, is coming our way. And no one can argue in a reasonable fashion why that is not going to happen. That is happening. It has been said many times that democracy is the dream of all who are oppressed, the hope of those imprisoned by fear or injustice. But the sad truth, that which is almost too sad to acknowledge, is that the betrayal of democracy began long ago when profit replaced the will of the people and corporate lobbyists became the masters of the universe. Alarm bells are going off everywhere. The American people are way ahead of the Congress and have figured this out and it's only a matter of time until Congress is beaten into you know, coming around on these issues. I mean, it, it, but if we don't do it soon, it could be too late. If it is true what a great civil and human rights leader once said that our lives begin to end the moment we become silent about things that matter, then freedom has already begun to atrophy because of our inaction. Slowly, sovereign rights fade away, as surely as the ink on an old declaration is removed by time. The pursuit of happiness, the promise of equality, of personal choice, are chipped away by complacency, and over time become barely visible in the world around us. If we had treasured it more, some say, if we demanded government cooperation, not interference, if we had exercised our freedoms every day, every week, just like the forces of power and money have done, if, yes, if only. I think that we should all get together and fight for our rights. I think that these are God-given rights. I think this is a legacy that was given to us at the beginning of time 
and we should fight like crazy so that people can maintain their rights from now and forever. There are some who say this is a battle that cannot be won. We are the David, they are the Goliath. But it's too important to sit it out and allow the multinational corporations and the regulators to inform us what our freedom should be. If we don't demand medical freedom of choice, we will lose it. It's critical that the people of Europe, the people of Asia, Africa, the Americas, and the rest of the world come together so that we can protect our health freedom for our generation and those of the future. This, then, is your call to action. It is one of enlightened self-interest, a righteous cause that even the high priests of profit cannot defeat. It is a real drug war, a fight for health freedom, a struggle for human rights. And so you get the government you deserve if you don't speak up. The only way to have good government free from all the things that are happening to us is if the citizens stand up and are not doing it. They have to stand up and be counted. And if you put enough effort, the good guys win. It needs to be done. Modern medicine has led us to Babylon and a wasteland of expensive and often ineffective options. If we do not act, if we become silent, governments will be free to replace the teachings of all ages with toxic lies. Timeless natural medicines, foods and herbs with which we have evolved, culled from thousands of years of collected wisdom, will be swept away, crushed under the myopic weight of corporate greed. Yet we often forget how much power we actually wield, and that we are the creators of our own place on this planet. Amid the sea of faces, there is an honorable cartel forming, one for the benefit of mankind. You must join the battle by protecting yourself and your family from health frauds. When you're in trouble, that's not always easy. But in the end, being victimized can be far worse. It can mean not only your money, but your life.